Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Business Brew. I'm your host, Bill Brewster. I'm excited to be joined by Rick Van Nostrand today. As a reminder, everything in this podcast is for educational purposes only. This is not investment advice. Any securities mentioned, it's not a buy or sell recommendation, and you should not presume either of us to have uh, realized any gain or be on the verge of realizing any gain in any security mentioned. So remember that. Do your own due diligence. If we have to clean up any of this for compliance, we will, Rick. Don't worry about that. I was wondering, is this for entertainment or for education purposes? You know, I don't know. I guess it's both, right? But I used to say entertainment. I do think it's somewhat educational, though. I at least try to make it educational. I I agree. I totally agree. I remember you having this debate on one of your podcasts, and I totally think it's educational. It's great entertainment, too, but it's completely educational. I think it's an important role. That's why I switched up that word. It's more serious than entertainment, but not investment advice, right? So that's the best way that I knew how to say it was education. So, Rick, do you want to tell people where you're at before we jump into where you've been? Sure. I'm at uh, Cornerstone Investment Partners. We are an investment boutique here in Atlanta, Georgia. We manage uh, mid $2 billion and kind of across value disciplines, but our heritage and our flagship strategies and something called the Concentrated 30. We go against the Russell 1000 value. And so I'd say that's part of maybe the contrast when I think of many of the people that I've heard on the Business Brew. You have people who are go anywhere investors, or you have people who research stocks like for The Motley Fool, or you have people who kind of are talking about their own PA, their own personal account. For us, we are highly specialized. We play a position and are hired by institutional investors to play that position for them. And then they allocate across different strategic asset allocation classes in order to put together a portfolio that achieves whatever their objectives are. But our job is to play a position and might make for an interesting conversation in that way. I'm certain it will, but I think that before we get into it, I think a good way to start is to help people understand how you came to finance and specifically your first foray into business as a college student. I wish that I had a less circuitous path, but I met all sorts of people who, you know, like some of your guests, boy, I was 13 and I gave up the comic books and started investing in stocks and I was not that guy. I had one competition, I think, in the sixth grade where you had to pick a stock. So, of course, I went to the penny stocks, picked one stock, and it's like, if you just go up one penny, you know, I'll win this whole test. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sound strategy. <laughs> <laughs> I naturally came to finance really at the juncture of my parents. My mom's a, a physicist who turned uh, kind of pure mathematician. And my father's a psychologist who ran a nonprofit. So you think about finance, it is the intersection of science and psychology, right? Science, you have a deterministic path. You say, hey, I shoot a bullet out and it hits the ground and exactly this far away, knowing this velocity and all that kind of stuff. But finance, we do all this stuff with DCFs and everything, and it isn't actually there. There's no, there's science behind it, but any one of your guests can come up with a completely different value for something and figure out what it is, right? And that's a frequent piece of conversation. But my background was uh, I was a computer engineer, got real interested in that and started to pay my way through school with it. And then suddenly found myself realizing I didn't want to do computers all the time as I ran into all sorts of people who were uh, computer engineers who wore little Trekkie pins around the office and did things like that. So I went to uh, what well, was at the time uh, Anderson Consulting, now Accenture, and helped redesign companies. And with my computer background, it helped, but I also had you know, some background in artificial intelligence and also background in uh, telephony and, and how networks worked and all that kind of stuff. All we did was really cut jobs. And that seemed pretty crappy. At first, it was fun. And then at some point, you're like, oh, my God, these are people's lives. You know, and your empathy comes up as a 22, 23-year-old. And I understand why we have to triage the patients, but how do we teach them not to stick their arm down in the tree mulcher to start with? And, you know, so someone says, well, you want to go into strategy consulting. And I said, okay, how do I do that? And three or four schools were mentioned to me. So I went to one of those schools. And they came out and went to work with a company called McKinsey and & Company. And McKinsey is a very good experience. But at McKinsey, they do a lot of practice development. And so kind of what they would call business research. And at the time, McKinsey claimed that they spent more on business research than the top 10 business schools combined. Now, I don't know how you value a McKinsey associate versus a PhD student, but they thought they spent 10 times or as much as the top 10. But this practice that we did turned into the book called What Really Works, written by my director at the time, Bruce Roberson and Nitin Noria, now the, the dean of HBS. What we were trying to do with that was to fix kind of the survivorship bias that happened with Built to Last and Good to Great, the Collins books. 
And, you know, it's pretty well known, right? They write a book, he writes a book about 10 names and you get to the back of here, these companies are going to last. And at the end of the 10 years, and guess what? Five of those companies were kind of in the dumpster. And so, you know, a lot of times people start looking and they kind of say, here's proof of success. Let me look at these metrics and what these companies did. And so a lot of people come on to your show and they talk about Amazon, they talk about Tesla. Well, these are the successes, right? And so it's easy to go back and say, this is why these companies are successful. Similarly, someone who did invest through the dot-com boom and bust, there were a lot of companies that sure, it was easy now to say that, hey, that these were going to be the long-term winners. But you know, did we remember you know, Webvan and Pets.com and everyone else who kind of went along the way? What McKinsey said is, well, let's instead just take this completely and just set up a quads of four companies, each in industry group, do 10 years worth of data across 160 companies. It turned into, I think, a really good piece of work that looked at winners and losers and companies that were able to improve themselves and those who lost it. That piece turned into a book. And of course, what McKinsey wanted to do with that was to go out to management teams and say, hey, here's your strategic direction. And so with this strategic direction, these are the levers you ought to pull, right? You're an innovation company. So spin on CapEx, spin on small M&A, and da 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 And oh, you're in a highly regulated business, then let's spend in these other ways, right? With return to capital and so on and so forth. Of course, I looked at that and said, you've got the answer. Why would you be talking about it? Why don't you <laughs> go and invest with it? And so I found myself on the alumni network for my business school. And I found myself here in Atlanta. Old weather wasn't exactly uh, in my blood anymore. No, I would not choose cold weather either, given the choice after the move that I've recently made. I'm not going back anytime soon. My mom's family's from Chicago, and I spent a lot of time in Chicago, so I totally get that. I have insane amounts of love for that city. I have no desire to live through another winter. Like, I'm done with that stuff. So, listen, when you got hired by Accenture, I think it's important to highlight what you did in college Because even though you may think that it's like a silly little business, it took a lot of initiative to put together what you put together. Do you want to go into what your businesses were that you started? It doesn't have to be a long conversation, but it's interesting. One of the things that got me really interested in business was just I had a partner who was uh, from Sri Lanka. I rode crew with him at at SMU. And he had an uncle who ran a uh, wood manufacturing facility. And this was way before anyone worried about green, but we were completely green. We had rubber tree plants, which are planted in big plots and then harvested on a regular basis and in a very ecologically friendly way in Sri Lanka. So we thought we'd bring this in and, hey, everyone will understand how great this wood is because it's as good as hardwood, but it doesn't require deforestation or anything like that. And so we were way, way, way too early on that and with the ESG thing now. I wish we had that. but And so then, of course, as uh, 19 and 20-year-olds, we came around and we tried to pitch Pier 1 and Bob Bay Company and Container Store and everybody. And we came in saying, you know, here's all the stuff we could do. How did you get the meetings? You're just cold calling people and trying to... Oh, cold calling. Absolutely. That's awesome. Yeah. (laughs) So it was absolutely ironic because we went to go pitch Pier 1. We got together, did our trip, went into it. And of course, the only thing I have is a blue blazer with khakis that, you know, was from my pledge semester of uh, fraternity. And I'm like, oh, and we're looking at each other. Well, you look really professional. We went and rented a car, <laughs> some sort of Chrysler with four doors so that we look professional in case they watched us when we walked in. I like it. That's cool. <laughs> you know, we spent a lot of time on that. And we put together these huge sample boxes and send them off to people uh, across the United States. I think we had some, all of our sales, we ended up make, getting a booth that we did at the uh, World Trade Center in Dallas. And so we'd go through and, and sell to people in there and raise some money, but it never was the big home run of, we'd like to sell 10,000 pieces to Bombay Company or something like that. What was the business plan? Did you have inventory before the sales or did you wait to buy until you had the sales? It had to be wait to buy because someone like Bombay Company, like you can show them the proof of concept and that aspect but they're going to go out and pre-qualify your plant to make sure that your kiln works exactly the way they want it, that your dyeing and the way you stain it looks exactly the way that they want it. You know, some of the others may be a little less particular, but my Bay Company at the time, this is back in the 90s, I'm sure you were uh, probably not a big fan of the place, but it was in all the malls and had this dark, heavy, you know, wood that looked like mahogany and, you know, it was a great way to add instant class to your McMansion. Huh, that's cool. That's a fun story as an 18, 19 year old to be doing that had to be like a very, it's not common that people are doing that as freshmen and sophomores, right? I mean, so you basically pledge in your fraternity and then you say, I'm going to start a business doing this. 
Yeah, I think this preceded the pledging and fraternity a little bit. Oh, yeah? Fraternity led to the other business that Mel and I launched in business school in undergrad. Which is arguably a better product market fit. <laughs> I just wish Amazon existed at the time because that was my the big issue. So this was what was called the College Student Drinktionary. Being a computer engineer way back before there was even Netscape or, or any kind of browser, right? You literally went around to listservs, you know, to access these kinds of things. I'm out and I pulled off a list of drinks and started giving them to friends and friends would say, oh, this is great. And, but I don't know what it means to shake and strain. I don't know what it means to layer drink. So I started typing up things and suddenly I'm realizing people are literally asking to buy this stuff off of me because I can't just keep copying it, you know, for free. And so I said, okay, you know, hey Mel, we got a business here. And so I wrote up some stuff. And then at one point I fancied myself to be maybe a journalist major, but I didn't go that route. And because I think I realized my skills were elsewhere, but we realized we had students who wanted to write copy, right? They wanted it for their portfolio. We had artists who were students who wanted to do that. We had a friend who became a, actually wanted to be a publisher of all things, knew he wanted to do that. So he launched a publishing company in undergrad as well. He published ours for basically costs. We got all these students to write stuff in for free and, and ended up publishing the College Students Drinktionary, which was replete with hangover ratings because we're two engineers who have to geek out about stuff like that. <laughs> That's cool. It's funny. I'm glad there aren't too many of these books that still survive. I'm probably be pretty embarrassed by it now. But I did run into a cocktail party at my, we go, my kids are at an international school here. And I was at one of these cocktail parties or something like that. And this woman comes up to me and is like, were you at SMU back in the 90s? I said, yeah. Oh my God, I have your book. <laughs> and we had done a test market of, I think, 700 or 800 books in our first printing locally before we kind of went broader. It literally had one and I hadn't saved one. I'd sold all of mine. The only one I had was marked up from the first printing. And she said, so she ended up giving it to me. <laughs> and I was like, wow, so nice. Oh, that's nice. I thought you were going to say she made you buy it from her for a, like a margin of safety like price. <laughs> <laughs> she should have. She should have. The scarcity value is high, but there's only a couple buyers. Yeah, I don't think it has the same level of insight and profit potential as uh, margin of safety. You never know after this podcast. We'll see. <laughs> if you can go search for it on Amazon. But yeah, that was the issue. Amazon, et cetera, didn't exist, right? There wasn't internet commerce. And so the only way to sell this was either at point of sale or to go and try to sell it to uh, like set up kind of pods of people to go and sell like University of Texas or something like that. And now you're it's big working capital consumption for someone who's paying his way through school. You know, it's, I can't just come up with $10,000 to buy, you know, a bunch of books and send them off to three schools or whatever. This idea would have been fantastic had we just barnesandnoble.com, amazon.com, you know, five years later, it would have been really easy to distribute and would have been a, an easy job. So, you know, when you look at how easily Internet's, you know, changed some of the way that entrepreneurs can kind of get stuff to market. It's pretty remarkable. Yeah. And then on the other side of it is because of how easy it is to get stuff to market, there's no barrier to entry in a lot of these things. So creating something defensible is very difficult. I feel it a little bit in content. Yeah. Oh, on content, you've got it because everyone wants to hear your voice, Bill. Well, I appreciate the compliment, but the problem is there's a lot of other guys that think the same thing. So I just got to keep giving people what they want. When we were talking, one of the things that I really enjoyed that you wrote, and it, it may have been in the email that you wrote me, but you said uh, that you think that you were a natural person to come to finance because of the marriage of mathematics and psychology and how that typically we can all do this DCF and it's what the value should be. But in the real world, market prices are seldom aligned with the actual value of assets. How sort of have you morphed as an investor and developed the patience to wait for values to come in line to what's your evolution been as you learned more about investing and left McKinsey? When I came to Invesco, I came to a value shop at the end of the 90s when value had been dead for a few years, right? And I know a lot of people come on and they talk about how all the dot coms didn't have any, any valuation, didn't have any revenues. It was measured on eyeballs and that and that's true, but it's not exactly true. Some of these companies were making money. And certainly there were there was so much venture capital money at the time that even if you didn't win by going directly to the dot coms, you could win by looking at companies that were producing for the dot coms. So the servers, the Cisco, the Juniper and all those kinds of things. And so there was a lot that went on in that space and value managers often got beguiled by that. 
one piece that I would say that was very formative for me was to come in as a dogmatically value person. One of my first books I really enjoyed was uh, Tom Copeland's book on valuation that's really a practitioner's guide. And it was looking at that piece and saying, okay, here they've got all this great valuation work. They've built a huge business on this. You know, and then suddenly value stops working and some of the powers that be kind of started pushing against the investment process to, quote, fix it. And seeing when you try to fix an investment process when it's not working, you really had to ask yourself, why isn't it working? That was an important lesson. So as I left Invesco to go to a company called Earnest Partners, it was kind of starting up at that point, then left later to come to Cornerstone. This focus on investment process itself is really, really important. I'd say that's something I didn't understand at the beginning. I thought you'd come out and just be a brilliant stock picker and look at these companies, know them better than anyone else. You'd have this insight that was the diamond and you'd pick it up and you'd go cash it in and make a lot of money. It's not the way it works. Mining diamonds is not walking out in the field and mining and finding a diamond. It is swinging a sledgehammer and knowing where to go and hit and, and then just working at it. And so I think the piece that's really hit me within Cornerstone, I'll say, and my CIO, John Campbell, my partner and CIO, is a very strong process guy. And when he came aboard, he and I both came on to really what I would call institutionalize this firm. But at that, I mean, we had a high net worth background, but we didn't really have a strongly articulated investment philosophy. And I think that's where you have to start. Like you say, here's an investment process. Well, what is that? And everyone probably just draws a funnel. But that process has to be building something. And so you often talk about, well, know yourself as an investor, right? Don't know thyself. For us, you know, we want to say, here's an investment philosophy. This investment philosophy identifies the market anomaly that we are going to exploit on behalf of our clients. And that market anomaly for us is really simple. I'm sure it's something you, you subscribe to. It's that stock prices are more volatile than the fundamentals that determine value. And we see that, right? Stocks move around all over the place from day to day. There are a couple other caveats that we put for ourselves personally. First is we take information to be a commodity and probably sounds stupid. <laughs> but what I'm saying with that is it is a commodity. It's an extremely valuable commodity, like gold's a commodity. It's very valuable. But what we don't want to do is convince ourselves that we found one piece of information that no one else has found, especially within a large cap realm. But even in small cap, there are a lot of people out looking for information and they are heavily covered by the street, heavily covered by all sorts of other people. And that piece of information that you think you find, that what happens with that false confidence? If you're right, if you're wrong, let's say. If you're right, then you make money with it. If you're wrong, well, you continue to believe that you're, this isn't just a one-phase game. This is a multi-phase game. And so if you're wrong and you believe you found a piece of information, so you think the market's acting irrationally, so what do you do to it? You allocate to your losing position. And so then you're wrong more. What do you do? You allocate to your losing position. And so this kind of confidence bias that people tend to have is one of the things we think we have to go through and eliminate from investment processes altogether. And that's the cognitive and behavioral errors, right? The reason stock prices are more volatile than the fundamentals is because of these, you know, these cognitive errors, because of these fear that creeps in. How many people sold, you know, we're still selling last April, even in 324. So we still we have this fear that creeps in and it's visceral for people. So processes have to be able to work straight through that. Uh, similarly, the other piece uh, that we would say is we don't forecast. So I know a lot of people come on and they talk about they're going to look out for 20 years or 10 years and figure out what the market's going to be for the SaaS company or something like that. We're looking at more value names. We're not looking for hyper growth companies usually. And what we're looking for is where those companies are going to be able to just simply repeat the embedded fundamentals that are there. And if I can do that, then I have a certain margin of safety with that. And so what I need to, for the company to do is simply to repeat what they've done in the past and understand where maybe they won't be able to do it. Because if they aren't able to repeat that track record, then my valuation doesn't really make any sense. How are you able to think about whether or not they can repeat what they've done in the past without doing some sort of forecasting? My sense is that you are doing like market level forecasting, right? Because you gotta, you have to think through how long can this reinvestment runway go, right? And you've got to have some sense of returns on capital, incremental returns on capital, things of that nature. Uh, yeah, absolutely. But what I mean by what I expect for them to be able to do is, for example, we look at 10 years worth of return on capital and we'll adjust return on capital, so whether it's return on equity, return on capital, kind of depending on the debt structure. And I don't mean to get too mathematical, but we'll make those adjustments and come up with really what is a mean return on investment for the company. And what I'm saying with this is I don't want to assume 
that the company is going to be able to, I don't want to forecast a return on investment that's greater than what the company's done in the past. So that's one piece. And oftentimes, even assuming what they've done in the past is, is not really relevant, right? Because when you think about the average return on capital of projects versus the marginal return on capital, most companies have gone through and exhausted kind of the low hanging fruit. And so, you know, we used to, we owned um, Microsoft when it was not fashionable to own Microsoft, uh, kind of at the end of a bomber's kind of reign there. And, you know, for a long time, we had people saying, well, is this really a growth company anymore? I said, no, it's not a growth company. <laughs> what part of trading at basically 12 times earnings after you took out the cash was a growth company? Yeah, it doesn't have a growth multiple. <laughs> right. It doesn't have a growth multiple and the market expectations aren't there for it. And that was one of the big pieces at the time. Now, this is before we really saw, you know, them take off and turn in Azure. They were off, they were launching Windows 365 at the time. So they were starting to step into three, into that. But .NET was out, but it wasn't really out for enterprise. It was more kind of as a, as a series of Internet Explorer and those kinds of like interchanges to just enable the Internet, but not to allow the whole iPads, iSaaS kind of stuff. That was a time that a lot of our clients were asking, how can you own this? This is basically in channel bound between 20 and 25. And so we could show them our valuation, say, you know, we have this tool that's done valuation since 1987. Here's how it's tracked. You know, Microsoft's done a really good job of tracking this. And right now I've got this gator mouth where the value is building, but the price hasn't moved. So we buy it and then, you know, suddenly they start launching a, a lot of their other stuff. And that was the next leg up for them. And so a lot of times when you think about like the difference between micro econ and real world economics is that we don't have these continuous functions. You can't just invest $1 and get, you know, your 30 cents return. In fact, people like this, like Microsoft, have to invest for 10 years to be able to make that big launch, that big step into Azure and everything else that's coming. You know, we made a lot of money with the name. It was a very good name for us across that. Yeah, I'd say that's an example of, well, we didn't really have to see them creating Azure. We just had to know that this company's been a, a very good allocator capital across time. And even though a lot of people at the time didn't like Balmer, everything was set up there as they were moving into it. What did your tool capture that the market was missing? I mean, it may not have been one thing, but you said that your tool said that valuation, at least per share, right, was increasing. What did the tool sort of see that the market was ignoring? What the tool is looking at is just basically a demonstrated history of producing earnings. And for us, we look at that on a normalized basis. And so we literally look back and we say, okay, how volatile is this company over time? And so if you think about someone like a home builder, you've got big peaks and big troughs because they're fairly cyclical. So you need to smooth over, the, smooth over more years in order to come up with what's a normal year. Someone like a Walmart, highly consistent, right? Shorter number of years. Microsoft at the time was about an average company. And so we we're smoothing over, I don't remember exactly, I think it was five years, it might've been four years. And with that, you come up with a fairly conservative measure of kind of the normalized earnings power for the company. Now, the second piece we're looking at is how much growth do we think they can generate with that? And how much growth they can generate, we look at a sustainable growth rate equation and just how much are they reinvesting back into themselves? How much profitability do they get? And then we ratchet that down if they're not actually expected to grow that fast. And so we use street estimates on how quickly they're supposed to grow over the next couple of years. We'll ratchet it down. We'll never ratchet it up because we say you can't really you know, grow sustainably greater than that theoretical limit. With all that, I think we were using at the time maybe a 6 or 7% growth rate on a four-year mean EPS that was very conservative versus what they're actually expected to do. And the valuation was just building. And so for us, we kind of look at this as like particles in space, right? You know, if, if I've got two objects in space and they have a little bit of gravity that pulls them towards each other, then over time, what happens? They're going to pull to each other, right? You throw something up high enough from the earth and assume it doesn't go into orbit, it eventually comes back in and collapses but it can keep going for a while and you just don't know how far it's going to go. And so back to my two items in space, what I want to see when I look at valuation is not simply the departure between price and value, but I really want to know that the company has built value over time because then that puts time on my side. If I'm investing for my two, three, four years, then I know value is building up. Then even if price is, is away from it, eventually price can get pulled up towards that value and probably through it. <laughs> and we'll probably sell it early and you know, one of your growth guys will buy it. The concept of business quality and growth as a margin of safety is something that took me way too long to understand. I always thought the price was the only margin of safety. 
When I look back at mistakes that we've ever had, it's been in being um, being too deferential to management's ability to repeat some of their track records, you know, and, and dismissing some of the errors. And you know, we had uh, Mattel, which actually, we, I call it a mistake. We actually made money with the name, but we owned it for a year longer than we should have because they had a big miss out of Barbie that they just didn't do a good job of explaining. And really, in retrospect, it should have been the first tile of Mosaic Theory that should have left us to really questioning whether they had control of that. And we had both Mattel and Hasbro at the time. We did very well with Hasbro, did well with Mattel, but then uh, just didn't sell it right when we should, you know, we should have because some of the fundamentals, some fundamentals were started to roll over. So now what we've started to interject is what we call tier analysis. So for each of our names, we literally go through and rate them. Are they a tier one through a tier five company? And tier one means it's a high quality, highly repeatable. It's got good moats. We have a scoring system. We go through and look at it. Interestingly for us, we score on ESG as well, which I know a lot of people probably think is antithetical to capitalism. But if you're looking at the long histories for these companies, ESG, the environmental, societal, and governance aspects are very important because negative externalities lead to what? Litigation risk, regulation risk, and legislative risk. And so, you know, when you look at for strongly embedded fundamentals, you don't want a company that is shortcutting stuff or causing harm to society or causing harm to the environment because that's going to come back on them. It just gets hard to handicap, right? I mean, I know that y'all cover some financials, right? And it's one of those arguments where people will say, well, banks are, you know, so they charge so much in overdrafts, right? So how do you, on the other hand, like the commercial bank, I would argue is the lubricant of all of society, right? And I mean, it's very, very important what they do. So balancing those two things, once you start scoring ESG, I think is difficult. ESG is still fairly nascent. I mean, we look at it, but I'll tell you, pre-Sarbanes-Oxley, financial analysis was different than it is today. Pre-Reg FD, fair disclosure, also financial analysis was different than it is today. So FASB, the Federal Accounting Standards Board, has kind of matured and grown up. SASB is doing the same thing. The Sustainability Accounting Board, the Standards Board right now. And what we don't have right now is, okay, you want to look at all the energy companies do all the energy companies report their CO2 production per barrel extracted at the same way? And do they all even provide the same information? We have standardized sets of financial accounting, but we don't have standardized sets of sustainability accounting. And so these are things where the business is growing. And you know, as a market participant, as an investment manager, as a portfolio manager, we have to be abreast of that and kind of digging in and learning that. But level disclosure are getting better. SASB's out there. We've been educating ourselves on that and maybe looking at their FSA exam, which is a kind of fundamentals of sustainable accounting. It's a developing field that does not have to be contra to, to capitalism. Good companies, as you're saying, should have strong ESG practices. Well, you know what's funny is I, for the longest time, had associated value investing with buying something cheap and then selling it when it's dear. But all of like my real heroes buy companies to own them over the long term, like when I really break down what they do, right? And to me, if you're going to be an owner of a company over the long term, it's impossible to art to ignore some of this ESG stuff. And I came to that conclusion no more than three months ago, right? Like talking to this woman, Liz Simi. And at the end of that conversation, I was like, man, I've really, really underweighted this stuff because ironically... I think a lot of like the people that traditional value investors pray to preach long-term thinking, but then the implementation of value investing in many circles tends to be like a short-term re-rating game, which is not totally consistent with sort of, I think, the text of what's preached, but also is a way to make money. Don't get me wrong. I think it's spot on. There's a question of what kind of value investor are you? I guess all tigers don't have the same stripes. And you know, if you think of more of the Sir John Templeton, then you've got the maximum pessimism kind of deep value approach. And then you've got, you know, people who are maybe looking at argue that kind of Garpy, you know, growth at a reasonable price guys are also value investors. And probably everyone is going to say, I've heard certainly on your show that even if I'm buying something at 76 times sales, but it's, you know, a billion dollar company, and I think it can be a hundred billion dollar company, then that's value investing because it's building value. And so there is a question of how far are we each willing to look out to the investment horizon? And for us, we're thinking three to five years, right? As we look at our names. And so uh, there's time for it to recognize value. There also should be time for it to build value. And I think it's just a matter of how much are you willing to discount that future risk? And what we've had out of the Fed really since the global financial crisis has been very accommodative monetary policy. 
uh, and that monetary policy has subsidized risk. And so with risk subsidized, it has pushed a lot of capital into all sorts of other assets, right? I mean, you know, it was just two years ago, right? Maybe just a year ago that we had, uh, what, $30 trillion worth of, you know, negative yielding debt from different kinds of sovereigns and even some corporates. So, you know, it's it, the entire term structure for Switzerland was negative for how long? For, you know, two or three years. And so as we look at stuff like that, you've got to go look for yield. And so that pushes yield someplace else. That yield might express itself as a earnings yield. And so that's part of what we've seen. And then the other piece of it has been once you've displaced that risk, then where else? And so now you see huge amounts of private equity going into all sorts of kind of recurring revenue business models. So that's why SaaS is getting really gobbled up here. But if I look beyond that, to give an example, at a small cap, we've owned a variety over time, we've owned some uh, you know skilled nursing facilities. And skilled nursing facilities, one side, another side, we've owned uh, different kinds of like uh, companies that would roll up anesthesiologist offices. So why did they do that? They did that because you could go in, you could buy this at six times EBITDA, and then you could kind of run the company, you could plug it in, give the anesthesiologist a better quality of life, or take this, this skilled nursing facility and overlay better operations and better purchasing, those kind of things, squeeze out a little bit of post-merger management synergies. But your company is trading at 10 times EBITDA. So there's, it's immediately you got a four times expansion on it. Those deals aren't to be done. You look at all the money that's in private equity, it has come in and it's, it's chasing those deals. And it's very difficult for those companies now to go and make those acquisitions that look nearly as accretive. Now, the good news is their public multiples are also up, but it's still difficult for, uh, you know, for someone to see that. So I think for us, you have to look at that displaced risk. That displaced risk now is because you have this really long time horizon with subsidized risk, and that has all moved out. That will come back in, and that's just part of it. It goes longer than you think think it can go. But some of these things that I think is interesting, are, do you follow uh, factor investing at all? Familiar with the, the term? So within factor investing for a long time, we've had a conflation between momentum investing and growth investing. Those factors have been very highly correlated. And so however you think about it in terms of alphas for those factors or betas for those factors, or if you think about it in terms of just kind of the market risk premium that each of those is having over time, you track it that way. What we are hitting right now is since we kind of bounced off the market bottoms on 324 of 2020 is what kind of came around, what in September has been a pretty strong move out of value names, especially October forward, we've had big moves out of that. And so we now are seeing a reversal of it. And now you're seeing value starting to outperform growth. And as that happens, guess what happened? I mean, it's basically, it takes all the momentum money that was pushing into growth and was conflating these two is now going to be driven into value. And I'm talking through passive structures. And what's interesting is that momentum itself is really a reinforcing mechanism. It's a virtuous cycle. Because as you have S&P, we think back to highly concentrated market with those names that have done well, and people allocate into passive investments, what do they do? You buy more of those things that are already overly represented in the benchmark on market cap basis. And so then you buy more of it, and then that they go up more. So it gets pushed more and more. So similarly, as we watch someone like ARC pulling in assets and, have, and having to, to trim some of the positions, those positions are going to be sold out. It pushes them down and she's selling her most liquid names first. But guess what? There are a whole series of names that aren't as liquid. And as you see allocation away, and so you're a momentum investor, you're going to sell those names that have lagged a little, you know, buy the names that have performed the best. Now you're selling growth, you're buying into value. That's going to push it more. So these are the kinds of things where the first derivative is turned and the second derivative is positive, or in this case, I guess, negative, if you're thinking about it as a growth investor. And so that first derivative is just going to accelerate negatively even more quickly, in my view. Do you think that when that happens, does that create a fundamental, more risky market structure? Or do you think that the assets rotate into the value names or the names that haven't caught in a bid previously? It's sort of zero sum as that rotation happens. Within the momentum, just element of the market, just talking about that money flow, that's a zero sum game. And that zero sum game is an opportunity, frankly. I think as a stock picker, the big move into different kinds of passive investments by investors across the way. I mean, Warren Buffett says, you know, if you're running your own portfolio, just buy the you know, just buy the spiders and kind of go to sleep every night. Okay, well, that's great. Now, as someone who has watched that market structure change from being 10% passive to 40% passive to over 50% passive, I'll take that because as everyone does allocates that money in. 
they are creating an opportunity for stock pickers themselves to go and find kind of those diamonds in the rough. Now, as a investor, you need to be able to ride through long periods of that not necessarily working. And so you've talked a lot about repeatability and all the elements that have to go into that on your show. And I love that as a topic because having that focus on knowing what you are going to be able to accomplish and finding kind of the opportunity and then not being pushed out of it before you can actually recognize the value. I think that's what's coming. And I think a lot of value investors have been waiting for a long period of time and you know, we've gotten a few head fakes with Brexit and things like that. I think you're actually now seeing a number of forces that are lining up and those forces that are reversals of things that have already existed. That makes sense to me. Something that has been interesting to discuss with people as I've been able to discuss some of the growthier sort of philosophy is the idea of like, well, I don't really know how to model the next five years, but I think terminal economics are this. Therefore, I'm really terminal value investor, for lack of a better term. And I think it is so. I mean, I've thought about it a fair amount, but maybe I'm missing something obvious. But if that is the way that people are looking at the world, which I think would be a consequence of rates, it's sort of interesting, right? Because it's almost like, well, the next five years of cash flow don't really matter as long as they're not hugely down or bad, right? Like as long as you're not bleeding just tons and tons of cash and all the values in the terminal value, who even cares about the next five years is almost some of philosophically what I've heard, which is kind of interesting to hear because it strikes me as not what investment is. But at the same time, I do think it's the kind of investing that's really worked over the last 10 years. I sort of wonder whether or not it's really smart or whether or not it's the wrong lesson. And I don't have a good answer for that. I hear lots of analogs drawn between the dot-com era and the present era. And I hear why it's the wrong analog and why it's the right analog and people try to draw lessons from it. You know, it is back to the old barb that history rhymes, but it never repeats. And that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. What people is, you know, I guess um, maybe for me, Bitcoin, I hate to even take the conversation here, but... No, thank you. It's good for ratings. People <laughs> love listening to Bitcoin talk. <laughs> And so I should not even talk Bitcoin, but it's a good parallel to draw because a lot of times when we th look back to dot coms, people say, ah, but you wouldn't have thought that so Amazon would win or you wouldn't. And therefore, it was right to buy it. OK, but Amazon sold off 90 percent from its peak. You had a great opportunity to step in and buy it in 2001. Webvan had everybody. I mean, this was George Shaheen, you know, left a major big six to go over and run it. And they have venture capital out the wazoo. I mean, we literally went and toured some of their facilities. You know, the distribution facilities were just insane. How can this much capital be deployed into this for basically groceries? And now to be fair, groceries have proven to be, you know, a viable business for delivery. But the web van model didn't work for it because there's too much capital that was going in to basically chase and support it. But capital was subsidized much as we see risk being subsidized. So I'd say that's the rhyme is that the venture capital kind of large and the follow on and everything else that came behind that, that was subsidized risk by the capital markets. Now you have it, it's just not the risk is being sub subsidized by the capital markets, it's being subsidized by the Fed. And the market's now realizing that. And that's why crypto and those kinds of things are coming in. It's people saying like, oh my gosh, we have a Fed that has a balance sheet that looks 10 times the size it was going to the global financial crisis. And we've never weaned ourselves from all these emergency measures that we, you know, they put on. And so then you hear terms like fiat currency, like Elon with his, with his tweet, and he'll take the latter talking about Bitcoin. Well, okay, that's great, but you don't know what's going to be Bitcoin. And so back to the point, yes, buy a basket. If you think that there's really, there should be a global internet currency, then buy a basket of it. But to make a call and say it's going to be Bitcoin is the same as saying, I know it's going to be Barnes & Noble. I know it's going to be Amazon. I know it's going to be Pets.com. I know it's going to be. And if you bought that basket in the dot-com, then you could do pretty well. But if you just tried to pick one, your odds of saying, I'm picking Amazon in 1998 was a difficult one. And I'm not saying it was impossible. Someone did it, but it was a difficult one. And a lot of times, just like in the Collins book, Built to Last, people look at their successes and say, ah, look how obvious it was if you just put all these things together. But it's so much easier to, you know, if you ever read like chess games, it's so much easier to understand the chess decisions when you look back at the chess game. But if you watch it in real time, you're like, oh, what's going to happen? You know, you don't know Kasparov's going to do this. Or that. But in back, you're like, oh, wow, that was brilliant. 
But it was, of course, he did that. When you watch it in real time, it's much harder. As we see risk cease to be subsidized, some of these methods that have worked in the past, meaning I'm willing to take growth now at any price in order to get that terminal value, is uh, not going to persist. And just to give you one of the rhyme, but not exactly repeated, at Invesco, we managed $54 billion in just the institutional business at that point. And so everybody came and sold us everything, like every kind of research, every kind of whisper number, every, every, everybody. And we had a hot internet analyst in at the time. At the time, those guys were like rock stars. And I forget the name of the fellow, and I wouldn't attribute to him if I did remember it. But he came in and said, there is no value too high to pay for infinite growth. Okay, well, that's true. But let me tell you something about infinity. And also, n divided by zero is not infinity, as people seem to think. It is uh, undefined. (laughs) So not to be too precise on mathematics, but he had the wrong concept. (laughs) Yeah, well, and the other thing that I have found myself thinking about is it's amazing to look at the returns to scale that the largest companies have accomplished. And I was way too close-minded on SaaS, things like Datadog, and I guess some of these names that I say Datadog because I think I actually kind of understand that strategy. I don't really understand the product as well as I need to. But, you know, the thing that's hard for me to get over, and I continue to find it hard to get over, is the amount of SGNA that's going in to create the growth. It's not like purely organic. Now, the strategy consultant in me or whatever would say, well, if your stock is this high and the employees are willing to accept stock and we think that SaaS is sticky, go out and just go get as much market share as you possibly can today. And if the stock re-rates, then you end up issuing more shares down the road. And who really cares if you keep your employees and you get the land grab? The investor in me is very nervous about that statement, though. This is, again, where it rhymes but doesn't repeat. You know, this is a big thing back in the 90s. And in the 90s, you didn't have FAS 123R. So you didn't have disclosure of stock-based compensation. It literally was not in the numbers, right? They put it down out of, you know, below the line. But this kind of piece where you are basically using your stock as currency is what makes sense to do when you have expensive stock. Because your stock is really cheap to you, but the market values it dearly. And so when you were applying that and you're buying people with the stock, remember back when uh, Lyft was trying to get people going. And so they used to give out a uh, stock to the Lyft drivers. And then at some point the stock doesn't do well. And so then what happens? This is just leverage on leverage on leverage. This is not financial leverage, but it's operating leverage and leverage within kind of the extension of the business model. And so when you think about the high SGNA that you're referring to, the high SGNA provides fantastic leverage as long as we're growing up. What happens on the reverse side of that? As long as these guys grow and grow and grow and grow, then that's fantastic. And presumably that's where strong growth investors will immediately look at the second derivative and say, okay, it's rolling over and I buy it. Then I'll sell it. And that's what they'll say. But you know already these have unsustainably high growth rates. And so you know there's going to be deceleration. And so then what do you say in terms of when I'm actually going to sell the name? That's a key lesson. So far, Investors who've been investing since the global financial crisis have never had any kind of sustained bear market. What do you do when you buy on the dip? I mean, what do you do when you see a dip? You buy on it, right? That's just what has been rewarded. At some point, that may not be what's rewarded. At some point, that may not be something that actually catches all names. So far, the Fed seems to be pretty happy to try to you know, backstop the economy and backstop everything. We've seen good policy responses that have, again, subsidized risk, not just by providing capital to the market, but also by saying, hey, the knock-on effects of a bad stock market are bad for GDP growth. And since they're bad for GDP growth, then we're going to backstop the stock market. Well, now you just subsidize risk because you took away downside risk. So that doesn't mean, though, that segments of the market can't be overheated and therefore correct. Yeah. It's a weird world where it feels like the Fed is actually, to your point, like supporting the market in order to support the economy, it feels to me like it should be the other way around. And that's also not totally accurate. I mean, the government did support the actual economy quite a bit also through the pandemic, but that's separate from what the Fed is doing, right? Yeah, absolutely. All the PPP stuff was, and every kind of derivative around that was huge in being able to backstop it. And actually, it's probably what gives legs to this, right? I mean, you mentioned we do own a lot of banks across our strategies, but a lot of the big diversified money centers within our concentrated 30 in particular, you know, consumer metrics are just phenomenal. 
if we would have been talking in February of 2020, and I would have said, Bill, there's going to be a big novel virus that's going to hit everybody. And I guess you knew about it in February, so congrats. But most of the world didn't know about it in February. This novel virus is going to decimate the economy. By the way, the consumer is going to deleverage. We're going to have double-digit unemployment, and the consumer is going to deleverage. Look at the reserves the banks all took last year. Now we're coming out of this year. CCAR went great for these guys. <laughs> yeah, and they get to release reserves and start paying dividends. It's just stunning. And not a little bit. I mean, we're talking about 10 cents on the dollar for what they reserved are actually being used. And so we look at a lot of stuff that's filed with the Fed and it's called Y9C filings, which gives great visibility into non-performing loans and everything that banks do. Boy, our adjustments we make for loan loss reserves right now are just, even with the re- releases, the banks are still very, very well capitalized. And so it was ironic. And part of where, where we did so well over last year with the recovery was really buying a lot of these pieces, realizing that the banks are so well capitalized, we weren't looking at a glo- another global financial crisis. In contrast, the global financial crisis, we were completely underweight banks. We only had one money center bank in the portfolio. And otherwise, we mostly had insurance companies that didn't have the same exposures. It's not that we called the global financial crisis, but at the time, we were getting a lot of queries of, how can you not own these? Don't you see how much money they're making You know, with CDSs and mortgage-backed securities and so on and so forth? Like, yeah, but I can't tell what's on the books. I can look at the leverage and see there's a lot of leverage. And then on top of that, when I dig down in, I'm looking at tier one, tier two, tier three assets. We had, who was it? Bear Stearns come up on our work. And Bear Stearns had 30 to one leverage, but their tier one assets was only 3% of their book. I mean, a tier one asset, meaning I can actually go out and identify a market price on it. So tier two means it's, you know, I can find something similar. And tier three is it's completely model driven. And they were memory serve something like 80% tier three at that point. So that means for something I can actually identify, I'm levered, I think it was 33 to one, and now I've got 3% on the other side. So I'm literally a hundred times levered versus anything I can go out and actually get immediate liquidity on without taking a hit. Yeah, Rick, remind me how that tier three mark or level three mark works when you need it. <laughs> I don't think it's exactly as you have it modeled, right? No, exactly. And that's why you couldn't count on it. So tier two, I might be willing to give you because I understand, you know, you don't have an on the run security, but you got something that's 17 and a half years tenor or something like that. Okay, you can interpolate that. But a lot of the stuff that was just put on and completely priced outside, and then you saw the sticky valuations that we didn't know about at the time. But now when you look back at, you know, the big short and stuff like that, you realize the banks were playing their own little games with that. Why were they doing that? Because that's how it was set up for them to do it. And so, you know, the hedgies at the time had it completely right. Those who were short and they were just sitting on stale marks. That's why you need to know what's in the books. Yeah. For us as a long only investor, I'm not saying we shorted anything because we don't do that. But in as long only investors, we avoided it. How do you think through the risk that fintech is bringing to the banking system? They seem to, my interpretation, and I'm not trying to feed you the answer, but I think the middle market. I'd be really worried about. I think that they're going to just consolidate and get big. I think you have to either be really big or some of these, like the lender relationships might benefit some of the smaller community banks that fintech sort of leverage. But I think the money center banks, I haven't been able to figure out how it hurts them yet. It depends on whether you think they really come in and does fintech basically kind of go at shadow banking? And so you think of other places where people borrow money, like a CarMart or America's CarMart, CRMT, which we actually uh, own in one of the portfolios. Do they get you know hit by fintech? Does it do something to subsidize risk? Read stuff about instead of looking at you know the Fair Isaac credit scoring and some of those things, instead of using actual credit exposure, let's go back and use alternative measures. So like, how do you use your checking account? How do you pay off your utilities and so those things and have. So there are pieces within fintech that will dig deeper into data sets that don't exist. My opinion is we see some of that come up, and I'm not thinking about payments right now because the payments are kind of put on a different side, but in specifically around fintech and how we think about the banking services that there is a huge percentage of our population that is unbanked or underbanked, then fintech does have an opportunity to bring those in. We own JP Morgan in the portfolio, have a lot of respect for Jamie Dimon, and Jamie Dimon on his last... I think it was an earnings call. It might have been a separate interview, but he said he was scared blankless by fintech. Now, when he says that, is that because Jamie Dimon does not have a plan for dealing with fintech? This guy has been skating ahead of the puck his entire life. So if he says that, he's not saying, I'm scared to death of this, my paraphrase for him, because he doesn't have an answer. He understands a path to how he's going to build to it and get to it. 
And I look at this, I think his approach will be something like what you saw out of Chambers back with Cisco in the 90s. In the 90s, Cisco spent very little money on R&D, and they put a huge amount of money in M&A. And I don't remember the number now, but I feel like from 94 to 98, I think they made like 67 acquisitions, something like that. And those acquisitions weren't to go out and just buy everything. They were very specifically targeted as, I don't know what technology is going to win, as Chambers literally said. I'm not, again, paraphrasing. So I'm going to use the market as my R&D. So he pulled in his R&D, put it into his, and then he has his own stock price, which has gone way up. And all these switches and everything are big stat networks where interoperability is good. And frankly, a certain level of homogeneity is good because it allows the operating support systems to, to, to function across that, that environment. This is pre-AIN that Cisco now does that allows kind of heterogeneous networks to work together. Uh, but at the time, it was real important to kind of have your, full, your whole stack. I'm talking about the OSI stack, kind of how, how um, telecoms works together. And he did that. So he made all those acquisitions. So when someone came out with a better level four switch, and again, I'm making this up because I don't remember all the acquisitions, but he went out and bought that. So, okay, we've got this kind of switching fabric. Great. That's more efficient than ours. Buy it. And he knew he was using overpriced stock to go and buy what he couldn't necessarily develop internally, because if he would have developed it all internally, he wouldn't have known what won. So I think when you look at that kind of real option theory being employed to your M&A strategy, I think you'll see a very similar aspect out of Diamond. Now, what Diamond did coming out of the global financial crisis that was really smart and very prescient is he looked at the global financial crisis and said, okay, why did this happen? And I believe, you know, a big reason that this happened is because there wasn't good policies and controls within the banks, meaning we're just allowing people to kind of write huge amounts of money in MBSs and then later on CDSs and later CDS squares, right? And so there are all these very difficult kind of products. And then who are you trusting to give you a quote back on it? So you didn't really know what your risk looked like. Risk management wasn't really there. If you remember, value at risk was a really hot topic back in the aughts. But there wasn't good modeling on it because the sources of the pricing, back to our prior conversation on tier three assets, weren't really there. Yeah, it's all the barbers telling you you should need a haircut, right? Like they're all basically pricing their own esoteric stuff that they're writing. Exactly. And But on top of that, there's also an agency effect. And that agency effect is if you're that banker who's writing those contracts and making the money with it, you don't get paid at the end of that, you get paid that year. Up front, yeah, no doubt. And so, you know, there were huge bonuses paid out to people for stuff with trailing liabilities that weren't even known. And so when all that came up, I remember sitting at the uh, Bernstein Strategic Decisions Conference and I think it was Diamond who came and he gave a talk about how basically they had hired something like 10,000 different kinds of people just into policies and controls. And you think, wow, that sounds like terrible overhead. And he's literally having to guide down, you know, the SGNA is up by one to 2% in his guidance because he's going to take this hit as he's investing in those people. Okay. But what is it that when you look at regulators, you know, what do they need to see? And they needed to see some level of contrition and not only the contrition, they also needed to see some level of, of action plan to be able to address it. And I think he had the vision to do that. So when you're on the back side of this and you're looking at a lot of moving people from being unserved or underserved into being served as a banking piece, there's a huge piece of regulation here that isn't something you just go and hire a compliance officer and you're done. And Wells Fargo certainly has seen that. So there's a real important aspect to building this as a core competency within the business and given in you know, society as a whole, not, you know, that, hey, we're not just basically stealing from you, which you could be argued, you know, was what happened with Wells Fargo or what happened with a number of the banks back in the financial crisis, then having the regulators be believable and being able to come in and say, okay, we've pushed against this system and we understand that their policies and controls are in effect and are doing their job. I think that's the part that fintech doesn't really have yet is we don't see great policies and controls and how all that's going to be integrated. Now, it's not big enough, so we're not worried about it right now. But at some point, it'd be a big enough piece of the economy that regulations will come in. Again, not to just to help your ratings, but it's the same stuff that's going to happen with crypto. Right? At some point, all the different regulatory bodies are going to want to have a look at it. And it's what we saw the first shot across the bow from China. Are we all willing to take a bet that China is going to be the last? Yeah, well, the Fed speech, what was it, yesterday or whatever, that talked a little bit about it. The Wells Fargo, did you ever read the Republican House report on Wells Fargo? It came out, I think it was two years ago, or maybe it was last year that it came out. I read some excerpts of it, yeah. Sit down and read it sometime. It's shocking. Shocking. 
how little they paid attention to what needed to be done. I think that's one of those cases of just not wanting to own what the problem really was. You know, and then all the hiring of the external consultants that I don't even think it was their fault. I just don't think that they were even in a place where they could win. And then when they had a proposal, it sounds like uh, Wells just sort of said, okay, thanks, and then never did anything to implement it. So that's a great way to piss regulators off. It is the issue, and that's where incentive designs are really important. You think, like, this started with a simple lever at the top. Oh, let's do more cross-selling. Okay, do more cross-selling. And then, but how you implement that makes a big difference. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Maybe Wells is a reasonably good place to ask this question. Have there been things that you saw as a strategy consultant that have created situations, whether they're turnarounds or whatever, that you just won't go near? When I was pitching Wells, people were saying, like, don't go anywhere near it. I'm just kind of curious, as someone that's seen the inside of a lot of companies and strategies, what, what your takeaways were. It's a really interesting question because I think a lot of times value investors are drawn straight to kind of turnarounds. And turnarounds now rely usually a new management team to come in and do something that the prior management team wasn't able to do. And certainly there are great amounts of money to be made with that. Wells is one example. It has certainly screened well on our work. And so we've uh, reviewed it multiple times and have not purchased it. I do own a little bit of it personally, but that's in a personal account that's away from anything we supervise. And that is because it doesn't really fit our process in terms of here are the embedded characteristics. And I think the analysis of the embedded characteristics of a company, and when I say of a company, it means the regulatory environment and everything around it. It also means the competition. It's just failed our fundamental analysis. And that failing the fundamental analysis has been they're ready to basically build and correct things. And certainly the Fed has not decided that they are. You know, we still have kind of a growth cap on them. And that raises some concerns. I do think the brand is actually pretty strong. And so the brand will continue. People will make jokes about it. But ultimately, if you can get another 10 bips out of your savings account, you're going to do it. I mean, how many people right now are moving to, you know, Marcus because it's paying a little bit more from, you know, versus MX savings and people will move money based on that. And so if the services are there, what is concerning is these are talent organizations, right? They're human capital and so as they say, the value of the firm goes up and down the elevator every day. Maybe that's not the case in a work from home, but there is a lot that goes. And this persisted for such a long period of time that there are real concerns, that especially on the commercial side, that you may see aggressive, the very assets that are required for the company to return back to business. For us, uh, I'd say that's a hard thing to fix. And unless it's really well articulated about how we're going to fix it, then that's a concern. You know, if I contrasted that with Citigroup and kind of looking at Frazier, when she came in, she came in and just off the bat says, OK, look, we think we are underrepresented in all of these markets. And so we're going to exit a variety of these that left a lot for Asia to go away, with the exception of uh, Singapore and Hong Kong, where they felt like they had a good level of critical mass. But for the others, they said, well, we simply can't build it there. It's not worth the amount of, you know, to come in and then basically be a subscale competitor, even if we invest substantially in it. So we'll exit it. That's been a you know an overhanging piece of the business that people have often looked at as kind of a real option. Well, maybe someday it'll be worth something. And I think she correctly made the determination, which was not a popular one, that, hey, we need to exit these markets and, and focus ourselves in these places where we think we can get it. Now that, oh, I'm sorry, where we think we can get, you know, critical mass. And so it's kind of like a Jack Welch piece of coming in and say, we want to be number one, number two in the markets we're competing in. And if we're number two, we're going to work to be number one. That's that kind of mantra. And that's a strong leadership piece that comes in. You can take, here's a little bit of underperforming stuff. We're going to cast that off. We're going to focus ourselves on these areas and march forward. Now, she's not rolled out her whole plan, but, you know, that announcement was within really a month of her, you know, assuming full-time uh, CEO duties. You know, that kind of strong leadership is something that's good to see from a team and one that really is thinking about kind of rational allocation of capital for one, but then also kind of policies, procedures, and, and building stuff and building kind of a, you know, recurring ability to deliver on that capital. I think that's a big piece. You know, when we are investing, we are literally taking our capital, like out of my checking account or my savings account, and I'm giving it to this management team. And I want that management team to do what? To earn me a rate of return on that capital that justifies the amount of risk that they're taking. And so I'm not willing to do that if the management team is saying, trust me, I got this. I guess the natural follow-up to ask is why is it okay for your PA and not for the firm? Because my PA, I'm willing to take a small position. 
and I see that there's a valuation opportunity there. If the brand is worth it, they're able to, to build stuff, uh, build kind of back to what they were doing, then okay. In Concentrated 30, it's got to be the 30 best names. This does look good. It looks like there's a valuation opportunity, but our confidence in the management team's ability to execute a, a return to generating what they've done over their past history is highly suspect. And I think with that question, it just doesn't kind of fit our risk profile. And so it doesn't push the next best name out of the portfolio. Can I say this slightly differently? So if I'm hearing you correctly, it sounds to me like there is probably a perceived larger valuation discount, but the range of outcomes is wider and therefore the confidence interval would be lower. That's well said. And actually, I will tell you, we go through and oftentimes when you think about individual investors, individual investors are running their money out of their PA. And then sometimes there are PMs who are a star PM and there's one person who manages money for everybody, makes all the decisions. We think all that creates problems, right? So my PA, I'm just the only person and I've got to justify it to my wife, but I'm the only person who has to really understand that investment and look at it. For a team, what we want to do is remove that failability that we can see out of an individual human, right? Because you have a star PM at you know one of our competitors and a guy or gal goes through a divorce or gets sick or gets whatever, gets hit by a bus. There's huge just human risk to that. And hit by a bus maybe is easy because you get the notification and so you just fire the manager. But you don't know that maybe he's sick or maybe he's had a death in the family or something that's going on that distracts him. Yeah, some emotional thing that he's not telling you about. Right. And so you as an investor don't really know that. So we want to remove that. And that's we think that happens best as a team. And the team aspect then interjects, while it makes the process highly repeatable, it does interject its own kind of problems, right? When we were at Invesco, for example, we had groups of PMs. We also had huge teams of analysts. And so we had a utility analyst back in, you know, in 98, 99. And the poor person just had nothing to bring right? Utilities look, just look terrible on all the work. So the best thing for that utility analyst to do is come and say, hey, nothing looks good. Don't worry about it. That doesn't help his job, right? His incentives are to come pitch something. <laughs> exactly. So he comes pitches. And so now as a PM, you're hearing pitches. So now you've got 20 different sector analysts who all come in and some of them are really good salespeople. Some of them are really bad salespeople. And they come in and maybe the guy who's a really bad salesperson, though, is a really good analyst and just comes in and doesn't present exactly the right facts in exactly the right way. And you wind up buying from the good salesperson who's not as good of an analyst or just doesn't cover a sector that has the same value opportunity. And so this idea about having a 30 stock portfolio that is committed to that. There are only 30 names. There can't be 29. There can't be 31. Alleviates part of that. The other part we alleviate is that we're all generalist. And so literally we rotate. So if we were going through and reviews Wells, reviewed Wells Fargo a year ago, then a quarter later we review it again. We'll literally have a different portfolio manager review that name and then bring it to the team. And then as we do it, each of us do our own work on it. And then we actually log a vote. What's interesting about your comment with the confidence interval is we do a two by two kind of graph, which has a quality of valuation on one axis, the vertical axis and the horizontal is the quality of the, of the fundamentals. And so when we look at that, we put a bubble down. Do you think it's a good attractive valuation with attractive fundamentals and how much confidence do you have? And so if I were to draw what we'd put down for Wells Fargo, absolutely, looks like a good valuation, but if it got a wide band of confidence around that valuation, and then likewise, it has pretty crummy fundamentals, and I've also got a wide band of concern around that. So I draw that out, and that looks really bad from kind of a risk allocation standpoint, in that I really don't know how this is going to work out. And so I don't have confidence that the market's ever going to appreciate my valuation, because it may never return to delivering the fundamentals that we think. I think a follow-up that you deserve to be asked is your PA versus how much you have invested alongside your investors. The majority is co-invested in your strategy, correct? Every investor here is invested alongside clients. I'm jealous when I hear some of your people come and talk on your show because literally my entire investment account is invested in different strategies run by the firm. And so my level of diversification is terrible because we basically manage large cap value, all cap value, small cap, mid cap. And so I've got, I think, I don't know, five or six portfolios with the firm and they are all on that value side, all domestic equities. <laughs> I'm like, where's my diversification here? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
Well, to be fair, I'll let you cite your performance because I don't want to mess it up, but your output is pretty impressive versus the Russell. What is it? Normally, uh, we think it's immodest for the portfolio managers to talk about it. So I leave that to my marketing guys usually. What I would say is that, you know, our long-term history, I think one, three, five, seven, ten. I think if you go back across the investment universe and look at us against our competitors, there aren't that many who have been around since going back to 2001, which is when our strategy started. And I think there are fewer than 100 in the large cap value universe. And we clearly come out at the very top of that. People can always request the information from you guys, right? Where can they find you? They can find us on our website at www.cornerstone-ip, like investmentpartners.com. We have a variety of information there, and that'd be the web to get all of it so I don't have to put in a bunch of subtext in you know, super fast speed with compliance language. <laughs> yeah, and we don't have to go through compliance <laughs> like with a fine-tooth comb. <laughs> But what I think is so interesting about what you sent me about your results and what we've talked about with team building and process in general as we prepared for this is, you know, I hear some of my idols and some people that maybe have motivated reasoning, perhaps myself included, say, you know, I don't want to have a group of people because groupthink can really ruin investment results. But it is clear when, if you request the information from Cornerstone, that you'll see the investment results are satisfactory, to put it in Buffett's terms. So how do you avoid that, right? I mean, is it a devil's advocate approach? Is it being just very, very honest and transparent? Like, how does the team foster the trust to come up with the right 30 stocks? So I would say there are two great quotes from Michelangelo around sculpting that I like. The one that I'll use in this case is... When asked how David was made, uh, Michelangelo's response was, well, it's simple. I've removed that which was not David. And so meaning that it, whatever the, the block of stone is, there were things that just needed to be carved away because David needed to be freed from the stone. Wow, that's a really pretty quote. It's beautiful. And I think what's important about it is when you think about investment processes, it's like a big block of granite or a big block of marble that's there. And you need to, to carve away the stuff that works for you. You've talked a lot. One of the things I love about your show is to tell people to know what kind of investor they are. And I think that is key, whether it's your PA or whether you're a professional. As a professional who's playing position, then, and my job is to beat the Russell 1000 value and our team's job is to beat the Russell 1000 value. And to do that in a way that I can articulate ex ante ahead of the fact this is how we're going to do it. So it's definable and then it's repeatable. And the repeatability of investment process is really important. And that means the team needs to overcome a lot of aspects. So part of the repeatability relies on having a team-based approach, but the aspect behind group psychology is very important. And so a few examples. We go through and we review each name in the portfolio or an idea for the portfolio each day. In large cap and small cap, we do a similar review. And that starts with 1 p.m. being assigned to present that name. And so that person puts together a deck which goes through all the fundamentals, goes through everything on the name, the valuation, everything. And it's like going into a doctor's visit. If you're going into your doctor and you say, hey, I've got a broken finger, then the doctor doesn't just say, okay, I'm going to put a splint on that. The doctor, after, well, in the U.S., checks your insurance first. But then, <laughs> but <laughs> it's a good addition. That is exactly what happens. <laughs> but the doctor takes your height, your weight, asks you about your general health. It might even run a, you know, a, a blood test and finds out that, you know, you're hypoglycemic. Maybe the reason your finger's broken is because you've got diabetes. You're not realizing what you're touching or not. And so, right, so the other pieces that go in, you don't just want to put a splint on it. Similarly, when you review a name, Every time you wake up and you own a name in a portfolio, it is devoid of transaction costs. It is akin to buying that again. So we never just want to have an inertial bias there of, I own this yesterday, therefore I should own it today. So every time you go through a name, which we do then about every month and a half, we're going through a name and we're revisiting. Why do we own it? What's the investment thesis here? So it's not sufficient that a stock appears undervalued. Why does it appear undervalued? What's the cognitive error, the behavioral error, the rest of the market is making around this name? And usually there's some bugaboo that's out there that people are overly concerned about with the name, right? So that's something that's being mispriced, that's given us an opportunity. And then from that, let's go through each piece, the fundamentals there, the, you know, what happened over this time and determine whether that is that still exists. Now, each of us has to go through and do our own work. And then we have literally in the, in the fair value model, which also does knowledge management and a bunch of other stuff like workflow management, 
we put in a piece where you have to go and enter your vote. Now it's password protected. So if we ever have you down in Atlanta, I'll take you in, I'll show you this, and you can go in, you can log, you can review the stock, you can put your own vote in. And now we go, we all come together and we've got a war room, which just form follows function. It's three big projectors. It's got Bloomberg and baseline and baseline. It used to be <laughs> fact set and all that kind of stuff in there, every resource of the firm. And the idea is now let's say one of our PMs presents Wells Fargo to you and starts going through and giving you a description, but you think you've identified something that, that PM's report doesn't. Well, then you'd bring that up or maybe you just your analysis disagrees. And so it becomes a co-production model with all of this just bashing heads against one another. And so this idea, two things that you know, McKinsey had that I, I really liked as culture and that I think we've brought into this room as well is that it's an intellectual meritocracy doesn't matter who says it. And number two, you have an obligation to dissent. And so if you see something you don't agree with, then you have an obligation to. Now, one forcing mechanism for that is you're going to have a vote and your votes can be logged. So we password protected and you can't change it. So we all sit down. And if you have a different opinion than the CIO, well, then you're going to need to explain why that's different. So what's the data you rely on? What's your analysis? And ultimately, what's your synthesis for it? Relax judgment a little bit because we want this, you want to add it to analytics, data-based, analytics-based bring that in, and then the team will work on the synthesis. And I think that's an important aspect. When you talk about the value of the show, the big value of the show has been able to broaden your network to different kinds of investors and then bring those different perspectives together. And I'm sure you synthesized a lot just over the course of your first season here. And so that's the same kind of thing we're trying to do with every single name. But what's important for us is that everybody does that under the rubric of the same investment philosophy using the same investment process. So those are kind of the rules of the game. And I think what that allows us to do is, you know, to play that position very well in kind of our box. So if we're supposed to beat the Russell 1000 value, then let's do that by buying the kinds of names that are, you know, mispriced versus their intrinsic value that are building value over time and have been able to do that consistently. An important aspect that I've mentioned to you and, you know, we, it's worth touching on is that these kinds of investment processes have to be highly disciplined. And the reason they have to be highly disciplined is because sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. So anything that works all the time is armed out of the market. People have identified that. I mean, you have, you have Simmons, you know, he's gone through and he's got a bunch of former physicists who are, have already figured out everything that always works. And he's not telling you what that is. So the rest of us have to go through and identify those things that work over time, but not all the time. And so now as, a, as an individual investor or as a member of a team investing, it's important that we have the strong conviction in the investment process so that we can avoid the, what I call kind of fix it. And so as a consultant, you have a manufacturing process and you're making cars and you start making cars and they come out the other side and there's a bad result in the cars. You stop the production line, you go back and you do, you, you know, you fix whatever wasn't going and then you start it back up and sure enough, the problem's fixed and you're making cars that are not defective. That doesn't happen in investments. If you try to go through and fix your process when it doesn't work, then you are going to break it. Now that assumes you're executing the process right and that you've identified an investment philosophy that is timeless and actually captures a market anomaly. Over our time, I think we've done that and we've proven it works. And so now the question is, when you run into a thing, an opportunity like the global financial crisis or the COVID lockdown, how do you execute in that time? And for to come in and as a value investor in particular, you should be ecstatic when March of 2020, uh, 2020 rolls around. I don't mean for the human cost, but as an investor. As a market participant. As a market participant, the babies have been thrown out with the bathwater. You should be out there. So, you know, we went out and we normally run about 30 to 35 percent kind of turnover in a year. Our annualized turnover in that first half of the year was about 60 percent. We sold a lot of names. Now, I will tell you that market sell off hit us and hurt us hard. It was a lot of our names got sold off. We had a lot of kind of names that were exposed to the economy. And those were the things that were sold off immediately. And then a lot of the things that were very thematic, like the SaaS names that outperformed, held on because people said, well, this continued to go. We don't own. And so that was harmful. But the trades that we made led us to you know pretty strong performance. And I would be very proud of how our team kind of functioned through that because there's everything going on. You're scared for your own well-being. We didn't do Zoom, but we picked up Slack and Slack actually has worked so well for us because now instead of having three screens up, everyone has their screen up. And so if I disagree with you, I say, hey, let me grab the screen. I'm gonna show you what I'm looking at. And that piece has become even quicker 
than it was when we're all sitting in person. We're trying to figure out how, as we come back to a hybrid model, how we bring that same quickness of sharing uh, analysis and, and thoughts and doing that stuff on the fly once we're sitting in a room together. As somebody who's been in Florida, I think that the people coming back together is going to be much faster than other people that I see project. But, you know, maybe that's because I live in a crazy place. But the restaurants have been wide open and people are hugging. It feels very, very back to normal. It's an older community, so a lot of people have been vaccinated. So, you know, I guess whether or not people want to come into the office is sort of a different question, but I think that there's a camaraderie at the office that cannot be replicated on video. It's just not possible. There's some spontaneous conversation that you're missing. I don't know which one it is, but I know that they're not existing. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that a lot of creative problem solving happens asynchronously. And, you know, so like we've kind of, again, form follows function, literally all the PMs or desk are built around our war room. And so what I'm used to hearing is just banner, right? And people talking. And so you're sitting in your office, you've got to keep our doors open and you've got an ear out and suddenly something piques your interest and you come out and then there's a impromptu, you know, conversation about a name or a piece of news or something. At this point, we, you know, we still do that. We spend a lot of time meeting with each other. And so there's time for banner, but it's hard to say, okay, now be spontaneous, right? <laughs> you know, we schedule pot spontaneity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. that's not exactly how it works by definition. <laughs> so something that people probably don't know about you is you have a hobby studying scientific magazines and neuroscience. Do you think that that has helped you build the investment team in the way that it's been built or like, contribute to how it's been built. I don't mean to imply that you're the one that built everything in the firm, but you strike me as somebody that's very cognizant of biases that people have and how to try to remove them. I'd say everyone on our team is highly committed to this kind of removing behavioral biases. The focus on investment process is something that, frankly, I learned from John Campbell, our CIO. He's really got that. And I think together and really as a, just a team evolution, we've done a really good job of building a team that embraces that. Big piece of that realization is that, uh, you know, Wall Street's filled with a lot of smart people. And when you've had a lot of smart people, then you generally think you can kind of outthink the market. And so, you know, there's that belief like, oh, if I can just go and do this. And so, you know, we did a, a lot of recruiting to just find, cause you can find smart people just by throwing a rock, but can you bring someone in who's smart enough to do what we need, so they need to be a genius kind of person, but we need them to have the humility to come in and say, I'm not going to fix it. I'm not going to change what you're doing. We can evolve it, but we're not going to change it. So come in, play your position. You know, I think that focus on process and I think a big piece of, you know, John's leadership around the, around getting everyone to buy into that. Like literally as he came in, the first piece he did was, you know, coin our investment philosophy and say, hey, this is how this actually works and this is how it works in practice. And that was really what I would think of as being the first step of exculpating David from the marble. So he came and said, look, here's what we're not going to do. Let's cut this part out, cut this part off. That's something we come in and say, okay, first thing, we're going to be we're doing fundamental analysis, but we're not going to out-research the market. I think that part, it doesn't tie directly into neuroscience, but it really ties highly into behavioral psychology, which is something I've enjoyed a great deal of. If you've read Kahneman's Thinking Fast or Slow and that whole set of work by Tversky and, and Kahneman are just phenomenal. And this idea that there are all sorts of things that happen within people that you need to be able to kind of relax in order to address has just been phenomenal. It sounds like a very cool place to work. I've enjoyed the background. I'll tell you what, if you guys do diligence half as well as you prepared for this podcast, I can vouch for you. <laughs> I think we probably over repair for everything. No, that's a good thing. You know what? I would say that you and Arnold Vandenberg have been the two that have done the most prep work thus far, and I've enjoyed it very much. I think it's going to be a very integral part going forward once season two starts up because some of the ease of the beginning episodes where I knew a lot of those guys, you know, and now it's kind of like coming into meeting people like you. It's been awesome in that way, but it does require a lot more work up front because I want these episodes to be good, right? I want people like you to listen to them and be like, these are awesome. So it requires work. They are fantastic. What you've identified, and I hope you kind of keep doing what you're doing with this in season two is I think you've done a very nice job of blending that individual investor with the professional investor. 
And there's a, you know, there's a brackish water you're swimming in that I think is unique for you because it's not just getting the professional investors to come in. It's not just getting stock jocks who are, you know, on Reddit to come in. And it's not just, you know, the motley fool to come in. You've gotten this nice brackish water. And I think the dialogue that necessarily follows, if people prepare, allow for kind of your own brand of uh, thinking about the market and that conversation to continue to evolve with each new voice that you're able to bring in. So I look forward to your future uh, podcast. They are fantastic. Thank you. Well, thank you for participating in it thus far. The reason that I think that it's fun to do it that way is I have noticed that Twitter is a place where a lot of people clash. And I think a lot of the reason is you have long, short hedge fund managers and you have long only people and you've got retail and like the way that they look at the world is different. And I think that there's a competitive element to the market in general where people want to prove that they're right. And what I've noticed is almost all of them are saying at least one thing that's worth learning from. So I've tried to pick people that I think can expand sort of the aggregate mind, right? And people will miss eventually, right? Not every episode is going to be great, and I'm going to have dumb ideas too. But I don't have a lot of long duration assets in my portfolio, but I have a couple. And I do worry that like it's a product of what I've lived through over the last 10 years. But I'm confident that 85% of my portfolio I'd buy again today, even if I was just from first principles. But I have gotten a little bit more growthy in certain names. I almost view it as a hedge, like from an interest rate perspective, if that makes any sense. It may not. I think being able to hedge yourself is worthwhile. If I didn't have all my retirement assets in our strategy, I would certainly be looking for a hedge. I just can't. (laughs) You had mentioned that there was... I guess value investors, like traditional value people sort of were looking at Intel a little bit more and you all went with Taiwan Semi or maybe it wasn't mutually exclusive, but there was a picking Taiwan Semi back in 2016 is a very prescient pick, right? So just kind of walking through how you came to that. We'd actually owned Intel ahead of that. And Intel at the time, I think had about 97% of profits being derived from data center. So a very high level of concentration within that. You recall there was a big battle with them and AMD. AMD had kind of finally gone to a fabulous model. It's before an NVIDIA and people were really thinking about GPUs so much for uh, for the server. You know, I think when you look at the value proposition of Intel, you had to tie it on two things. One is what was the value of kind of their intellectual property around CISC, the complex instruction set, you know, computing that they do, kind of the quote x86 kind of topography. And then on the other side of it is what about the lithography? How about how about actually the science of making chips? And so at the time, I think they were at 45 nanometer going to 32 nanometer and nanometer kind of the width of the line that you're trying to etch, right? And so- Yeah, it's amazing where we are today. <laughs> now we're getting confused about whether it's eight or six and, you know, because four, because people aren't all measuring at the same, the same way. And that's kind of come up with the tri-gate stuff is now we look at multiple layers of this because it's all being rendered in 3D. But at the time, TSM- was basically two iterations behind Intel. And so when you watch that, I'm talking about kind of back in 12, 13, 14. And so when Intel went to 45, Taiwan Semi was just getting around, even kind of getting their production facility set. So then the step down to the next node was, you know, that was about the time that TSM was getting there. And so there was an inherent computing advantage in terms of speed and loss and basically energy efficiency that if you just use the CISC architecture, you had. And so you kind of gave back immediately some of the advantages that risk architectures like what ARM Holdings does. And then later what you saw in NVIDIA as you've seen kind of the GPUs go with smaller cores and in, in kind of multi-parallel processing. So those aspects, what we saw was Taiwan Semi basically put together two teams that just went straight at, okay, we're going at 22, I'm sorry, we're going at 32. And then I think for them it was 25. I don't remember exactly. I'm sure the comments will, will correct me on this. But they basically skipped, you know, two nodes. And at the time, Intel basically had what they were calling TikTok, I think under Odolini at the time. And TikTok was, look, we're going to come up with a new node. And then the talk was, we're going to bring all the architecture onto it. We come up with the nodes, we're going to manufacture at 28 nanometer. And now we're going to bring all these different pieces on the next year while we figure out how to do the next node. And that worked brilliantly. But Taiwan Simi, in the course of literally two years, was able to close that gap. And we saw that, we said, wow. So now you've had a huge step forward that they've managed to do. So now they are at par with lithography. So now we're producing at par lithography. 
then at the time, what did you have as a competitive response from, from Intel? Number one, they kind of started to lose it on lithography, and that's where they now they've fallen a node behind. They went to Trigate, so they stepped up and they started doing, you get faster gate switches with less power as you kind of increase the, the north-south build instead of just putting these in a single layer. So they did have some advances there. But the problem is Taiwan Semi has basically the world that they make for, right? You know, 20 years ago, it was Taiwan Semi and it was UMC and those global founders. But it's only been one winner, and that's been TSM. And this is one of those places where it becomes basically the bigger going to get bigger. And that's because back, I remember 2001, I believe, IBM was, was making their chips, which they still do. And they were building a new facility, a new fab in uh, Fishkill, New York. And I believe they paid about a billion and a half to build that. Then whenever we we're at about 32 nanometer, a new fab cost about four and a half billion. A new fab today is north of 10 billion. 10, 11 billion. And so you can't just justify it. Yeah, the capital requirements just get out of control. Right. So the capital requirements are out of control. TSM is there. But now, so TSM has matched and then ultimately passed Intel on that trajectory for lithography. But now I, what had happened to the other piece of the value proposition, the core competency of Intel? And it was around the CISC architecture. So yes, is it very good? Absolutely. But is it the best? Not for every application. So then what happens? Someone else comes in with kind of the next thing. So I don't know how to tell you who the next thing's going to be. And certainly I wasn't calling for Bitcoin to hey, say that, that you know, graphic processors were going to be the ultimate piece because of the, you know, the multi-streaming with massive scale and parallel processing. But who's going to make it with whoever does come up with that idea? And that's TSM. And so looking at TSM, they just had the market that if you needed to do high performing circuits it's going to be them. And that's what's played out. And they've continued to hold that spot. And so it continues to be a position in the portfolio. So how did that overlay with your model that sort of looks at historical returns on capital, right? That is is a very insightful, qualitative conclusion that leads to a growthier outcome than maybe something that looks more at historical mean reversion type stuff. That's the value of having model that goes back that many years. I mean, if I look back at our price in 2014, 2013, we had a price at 17 and we had a value of 31 on a normalized basis. And that has persisted. Now, throughout that, so if I look at that in 14, by the time I'm at 16, the value built to 35. And if I look at carry it forward to 2018, I'm looking at a value of 63. So this is a company that's building value as those fundamentals are coming through. And that's kind of my piece is that, that my point is that if I just look at the normalized history of what the company's done, it was still being mispriced by the market. So I've got all the value of that fundamental analysis that I just explained to you that we were doing in understanding why the company was going to improve its fundamentals. So my normalized value that I'm basing the purchase on or the team's basing the purchase on is actually using a very, very conservative estimate of that normalized value. In fact, we know the company is actually building value over time. You know, sometimes on your show and others, you hear about this concept of value compounders, of compounders, right? And sometimes people are talking about compounders almost as hyper growth, but compounders can happen in other businesses too. Someone like a Taiwan Semi that doesn't have to be hyper growth, you know, even someone like a FedEx without a few missteps is a good value compounder over time. FedEx is one also I have to declare that we own in the portfolio. FedEx, I was interested in, I think it was 2019, they were going through that merger problem and then they had all those problems over in Europe, the integration. The one thing I couldn't fully get through over is the amount of CapEx that that business requires, but it's a hell of a business and Fred Smith is a beast. He's a beast and what is he, 72 now, I think. And you always love to see the founder CEOs that are there because they do have a special commitment to their business. There's a good chance, I don't know, but I'm totally speculating that Fred Smith might have ridden out into the sunset in 2018 or, or wished that he had. Because, yeah, then they have the, uh, you know, the poor acquisition of, uh, was it TMT? Yo, they got the cyber attack, like totally messed them up. Like that was a big deal for them. Are you guys interested in the ultra low cost air carriers at all, like Ryanair and stuff like that? It's a really good business model, actually. It's weird, but it's good. It's a super business model. You just watched, saw the report last week. The CEO came out at Ryan Aaron and said that he thought they would be at 90% of 2019 levels by September. And so, you know, that snapback, because ultra low cost is so much consumer, you know, this is a European dominated firm. Short answer to your question is no, we're, it's not screening for us. No, we're not taking a look at it. I don't know if I'd put it in the top 30, but like as a business case study, it's super interesting. Super interesting. 
and he's a fun guy to listen to. <laughs> I used to live in Dallas, and so in Dallas, of course, there's Love Field, and Love Field is you know L U V the ticker for Southwest is that was where Southwest got their start with you know Herb Keller basically drawing on a napkin. Hey, let's just let's just fly to the contiguous states around Texas because when when Dallas built Dallas Fort Worth, they basically put in I forgot what it was, but basically a mandate that you couldn't fly beyond a contiguous state from Love Field because uh, they wanted everyone to keep all their light operations and move them to Dallas Fort Worth. Yeah, because American paid somebody to do that. Yeah. Probably. Well, maybe they wish they hadn't because, you know, so Keller's idea is, hey, we'll turn this into, you know, Greyhound buses and just fly from two contiguous states. But no one said we couldn't fly from contiguous state to another states, right? Yeah, so when you look at that, like that insight, you know, it was just phenomenal. And then, of course, Ryanair is taking it a step further. You might say that save here. Allegiant, too, they came back quick. They filled up their loads by, like, I don't know, maybe May or June. It was crazy. Not at 100%, but I remember reading that and the cruises saying that the older customers were just opting to book next year. That was shocking to me because I was thinking, like, okay, well, the older people would be the least likely to go on a cruise after a pandemic that takes out older people. I was very mistaken. Cruisers love cruising. That was my takeaway from all that. No, you're right. The level of repeat, like everyone I, I met on the ship were huge repeatability of traffic and they do just love it. And honestly, it seems like the names, both RCL and CCL do a really good job of, uh, and I own a little bit of CCL personally, but do a really good job of kind of that stickiness to bring people back. And so I have no doubt, and he saw the first kind of births go and they were just, all they wanted was just pay me something so you get on the boat. And I'll monetize you while you're on the boat, but I'm not even worried about it because I just want you back because it's not the nth time, it's the nth plus one time that I'm going to you know, bring forward. It's genius. I have, feel like those are probably going to be really good recovery businesses. Yeah, it's a recurring business that people don't think of as one, but it like actually is. Now, you can't model it as one, but like the customers love it. So, well, Rick, we're coming up on time, man. And I just want to say thank you very much. And again, where can people find you? How do you want to leave your contact or just go to the website? Or Sure. The easiest way to reach out to us is through LinkedIn or through the Cornerstone website at www.cornerstone-ip.com. Then for those who use LinkedIn, I'm on it and I'm on Twitter as well, but I tend to be more of a lurker than I am a publisher. We understand that. That's many people out there. So thanks again and have fun. It's been fun getting to know you and I look forward to uh, continuing our conversations. I really appreciate it, Bill. You're fantastic. (laughs) 